Three massive points dropped for Aston Villa after losing 4-2 in the semi-final midweek. It feels like a week of hell for the Villa fans as they now look into the last two games of the league and that European semi-final second leg with everything's on the line now. The grasp on top four is there, but it's not over the line yet. And coming away to play Brighton this weekend, everyone at Aston Villa would have been hoping for a nice steady performance, get a point, try and get three, don't let anyone get injured and take some confidence and momentum into leg two against Olympiacos. Sadly, that didn't happen, but I was really impressed with the way Unai Emery set this game up, how Aston Villa approached it, and they really, for the largest time, you know, with the limited resources Villa have at their disposal, fit personnel, rotation options, etc., they really nullified, they killed like 60 minutes of this game with a lovely little tactical tweak, which we'll talk about in the video today, as well as one or two other interesting things that happened in the match at any point in the video, but if you do laugh, you learn, you like something or whatever, please do like and subscribe to the channel. We're pushing for 10,000 subscribers and we cannot do that without your support, guys. So yeah, get into the comment section and let me know what is your thoughts and expectations for Villa over these last three games. Are they going to make it? Well, the last four games, will they make it to a final? Will they finish it off in style? Or is this the beginning of the lackluster kind of maybe end to a very, very long season. And let's just get stuck straight into it. Now, one of the most impressive things about Unai Emery this year is how he's managed to, you know, roll with the fixtures, play his best players in the best position possible to hurt the other team and get the most out of all the assets, all the players he's got at his disposal. And I thought today was a fantastic example of Unai Emery, like, chess bomb as I've been calling it. The most striking thing that happened in this game is we've seen like a real front three from Aston Villa right from the off of Bailey, Diaby and Watkins and they were really pinned in on the, the Brighton back four here which meant that the likes of Veltman and Igor didn't really have any license to move. It put a lot of pressure on Gilmore to get up and down the pitch to carry the ball to try and find the likes of Gross and Pedro to then try and get their own attack on the line themselves. And when you add Morgan Rogers into this number 10 false forward position here some of the best stuff he's done from Aston Villa has been coming inside from those wide areas. And with that clear strength he's got, I thought he did a really good job in the, the first half throughout the game before he came off, you know, in this position here. Just, you know, really strong extra forward to try and support this very different kind of old school real front three. Because what this allowed Aston Villa to do, and we'll see this as the game goes on, even with injuries and substitutions and whatever, but either Rodgers would be up here alongside Watkins and Diaby would kind of maybe be a little bit deeper. And what would end up happening is we'd end up with this kind of diagonal line of Aston Villa across the midfield with McGinn and D Douglas Louise and Diaby on this side here with Rodgers kind of tucking in. Or sometimes it would be a wee bit more like Diaby would be a bit higher and maybe Rodgers would be coming in to make that kind of left diagonal line. Uh, I think once or twice as well, if we did find Rogers on like this side of Watkins on the right, if he has came over here to try and play with the ball, we'd see the Abbey be a little bit deeper and it'd almost feel like two kind of actual lines uh, at the back here of three. Because with Consa being this right back and just kind of tucking in alongside Carlos and Pau Torres with Luca Dina being, you know, a little bit busy on this side of the pitch, you know, the, the back three as it were. And then this kind of midfield line that we had just felt like it really carved uh, a, a really nice slice across the pitch. And really, it didn't feel like Brighton had anywhere to go. Yeah, so it was more like Douglas Louise would be closer to Diaby. And McGinn was very close. Like, McGinn, all the way throughout the first half, was always in a little triangle between Consa and uh, Diego Carlos here, just to protect this little extra zone here. And no matter where the ball went, you always found that either McGinn or Douglas Louise were in there supporting the defence against whatever Brighton player was going to be trying to progress the ball and turn the pace on it. But everything was kind of focused a little bit more down the left for Villa with Lucadinha coming up to support the attacking players here and with Rodgers maybe being a second forward on this side with Bailey loving to come in on his left foot. Obviously, it's just kind of then everything just felt like it was very left, left heavy. And one of the standout players for Brighton in this game was Adringa. He was just left in a huge pocket of space all the way throughout this game. And it was definitely a, a conscious decision from Emery to say, let's give them that false space over there so that they can always attack everything from Brighton, come down their left-hand side all the way through this game. It was a Dringa v Consa constantly. But with this kind of diagonal line that they kind of built across the midfield with Diaby, uh, Douglas Louise and McGinn, it meant that there was not really any opportunity to change their mind, to go down the right-hand side or try and play through the middle, just with the way that Aston Villa totally congested everything out. It, forced Brighton to continuously come down the right-hand side here and put Adringa into a one-on-one -on -one situation, put Welbeck into a 1v1 one, one one situation, and the likes of Pau Torres, Big DC, and Consa, for the most part, 
did pretty well. I know Consa probably didn't have his best game, certainly, in a Villa shirt, but, you know, they stuck to their man, they stuck to their task, and all the way up until the 60th minute, this is the only thing Brighton had going for them, was down the left-hand side for a Dringa, because Villa let them. Villa told them to do it. Aston Villa were attacking with pace. Watkins and Diaby, Bailey, all these guys were looking like trying to get something in the game, because very early on, Aston Villa want to score a goal, want to take control of the game state themselves, so that, you know, they do have other things going on. They want to maybe rest some players for next midweek, and maybe not let some people get into a position where they maybe get injured because Aston Villa have had a horrem horrible, horrible, horrendous, <laughs> horrible <laughs> injury crisis this season. So when Rodgers comes off injured in the 26th minute for Matty Cash, this was a huge, this really caught my attention. What is Unai Emery going to do here? Bringing on Cash at right back? Is he going to put Dina forward? Is he going to change shape completely? What's going to go on here? And what happened was just keep the strategy the same, but we swapped the personnel around. So Cash came in on the right-hand side here. So it's kind of like two right-backs on this side. So Adringa had a little bit more care because Cash was a wee bit quicker to recover and come back here versus a Bailey type. Bailey does love it, don't get me wrong, but Cash was a wee bit more uh, defensively sound. Bailey then goes over onto the left-hand side and we see Diaby coming into this zone here in the middle. Like we've seen him do before, like we've seen him do in Europe that uh, Rodgers was doing in this role here. And again, with Bailey on this side and Diaby either pressing up or if Bailey was up high on the line, you'd have Diaby kind of coming back in here. It was the same pattern, it was the same strategy, the same tactics. And I thought this was a fantastic use of individual attributes and abilities because Cash had a very good season overall. I know not everyone's his biggest fan. And the best things about Cash is his attacking attributes. So having him high up the pitch with his pace and with the delivery he's got really does then force the the Brighton defence to consider him when trying to, you know, maybe bomb on or commit an extra man or whatever. So I thought that was a great move from Unai Emery to lose a key player in the strategy like Morgan Rogers and with one change, adapt it and keep everything kind of same as is. Now, I do think as the game went on, McGinn and Douglas Louise were coming under more and more pressure because these guys in the middle were just getting way more anxious to try and actually get on the ball and try and feed Welbeck, try and feed Adringa, because the possession was fairly even. The ball turned over quite often, not too many long periods of possession for one team or the other. But McGinn took a few too many touches at times, same with Douglas Louise. I think like both of them did good, but we didn't see any of them actually like break a line too often and like actually travel with the ball. Billy Gilmore had a really good one in the first half, and we've seen it happen from all the Aston Villa players, but what I think is missing is maybe like that Yuri Tielemans energy in midfield a little bit here. McGinn's had a long season, Louise has had a long season, and I know it's a nice kind of alternative situation that Unai Emery's managed to build here, like we're talking about, but it's definitely not optimal. But yeah, some Aston Villa fans might call it crazy. They might be absolutely raging with Emery for not like identifying the Adringa problem and maybe doing a little bit more about it. But for me, this was an, a direct attempt from Emery to force Brighton to attack a certain way to try and, you know, then stack the odds in Villa's favour. We know how you're going to attack, so we're going to make sure that Welbeck's not going to get anything out of Torres and DC. And Consa, man-to-man with Adringa, like I say, I know he got shredded a few times by pace, but there was always someone there to cover in for him. Olsen didn't have a great game, but, you know, he did come out with some big saves. He did technically save a penalty as well, sort of. And I think for Villa, it is all hands on deck. Now, for me, when you don't have Diaby, you don't have Watkins, Bailey, any of these guys coming out with a little bit of magic from the edge of the box, a little bit of luck going your way with a set piece, getting a ball pushed over the line. This game away to Brighton, a draw would have been the best thing you could hope for. Ultimately, it's been decided by the penalty and the rebound, the goal. Both teams had goals, uh, yeah, both teams had goals chopped off by VAR. And ultimately, this game could have went either way. I don't think the Aston Villa squad will be coming out of this feeling too bad beyond the, the three points dropped, of course. It wasn't like they capitulated, had an awful day at the office or whatever. And I think like, there should be still that kind of focus, that determination from the Villa squad coming into the second leg against Olympiacos that they can get the job done. Villa's last two games of the season at home in Liverpool and then away to wildcard Crystal Palace is going to be, you know, a really big task. The last two games of the season were such a long season that Villa and a lot of the individual players have had. It is going to be all hands to the pump and if Aston Villa are going to, you know, seal that memorable season, maybe a European finals on the off and getting into Champions League football for next year, it is going to come down to the last couple of games, guys. Results for Villa, results around the league as well and everything else in between. And if Unai Emery and the team can keep this uh, level of tactical discipline and you know, hopefully enough players fit and available to actually try and implement it, then I'm quite hopeful they'll be able to turn over Olympiacos in the second leg. And in between the last two games, maybe they can just about get a point, three points from, 
I know you're expecting them to beat Palace, but it will be hard. And just guarantee that top four position. Love to see it. And let me know what you think down in the comment section down below. On screen there now is some other stuff that I've made that YouTube thinks you might enjoy. I hope you enjoyed this one, and I'll catch you on the next one. Take care. Bye-bye.